Oh, does he have the Macabre in his back to back? All right, guys, we're back, and you know the drill. It is round number 10 between Estanita Martina from the Netherlands. She played Dinosaur before, she's still playing Dinosaur. Markus Schmidt, he swapped decks uh, prior to our previous announcement and what's happening now. He's now playing Paleozoic Frog because we found the correct deck list. So th basically that is all you need to know about this match because we're a little bit behind the main event. So let's go to the feature match for round number 10. All right, so Marcus on the left, Estanita on the right. Um, who is the favorite in this matchup, Paleozoic versus Dinosaurs? Uh, I think if we see Marcus winning the die roll, he'll be in a very strong position here. Main deck, Dimensional Barrier, Anti-Spell Fragrance, and Rivalry of Warlords could all cause problems. Uh, Isn't Paleozoic like one of those decks that doesn't usually mind going second? Uh, Paleo can do fine going second, but we see a lot of Floodgate continuous mm -hmm. traps here. Well, the way he built his deck. The, the Dimensional Barrier, not, not a continuous trap, but it lasts for the whole turn. So those can really just shut the, pa the, uh, the dinosaur player out from being able to do anything at all. Right. So let's see what Estanita has to combat this. It seems like she's going to go first. OK, so uh, if Estanita's playing first, she'll be looking to make her way to uh, the true king of all calamities to lock out water monsters from being special summoned, or potentially use things like uh, Phantom Fortress, Enter Blathnir, and Trishula to rip some cards from the hand. All right, very leger Enter Blathnir way is of awesome. kicking things off. Sorry, what is awesome? Enter Blathnir. The Enter Blathnir. <coughs> You're right. Is it? Uh, yeah, okay. I always call it Enter Blathnir. Um, what do we know about these players? Maybe we can bring up their win ratios or how they did before. Yes. So we know that both players are currently on seven wins, one draw, and one loss. Yes. So that puts them in a position absolutely locked for the top 32 if they're able to win these last two rounds. Mm -hmm. But a single loss at this point puts them out of contention. Yeah. Like, like we said earlier, um, all that hard work, <laughs> kind of for nothing. So the pressure is really on, and, and the feature match just adds to that, of course. So here's a Monster Reborn. have seen that yesterday before, but... Uh, before this event, we haven't seen this ever on the stream, as Luke pointed out, and rightly so. So we see uh, the Soul Eating Overaptor here getting its effect, whether it's normal or special summoned. So Foolish Burial and Monster Reborn coming through to pull it out of the grave, get that effect triggered without even using up the normal summon for the turn. But this is one of the go-to combos of this deck. Yes, and in combination with the Dragonic Diagram, searching those uh, baby dinosaurs, the Babies. Petty Tyrannodon yeah. and Baby Sarasaurus, we're able to destroy them from the hand or the field. They don't even need to be summoned and continue to summon out dinosaurs from the deck and just add to the pressure. So, yeah, Dragonic Diagram destroying the Baby Sarasaurus. Not only is it going to get a search for a true king, it's also going to get the baby Sarasaurus on destruction effect. Mm. I'm, I'm wondering, is she doesn't seem to have like back rows or anything that prevents your opponent. How does she like make sure that the opponent cannot interact with her field? Uh, the interaction that she's going for is all in the monsters. Mm. So the true king of all calamities can prevent special summon of a certain attribute of monster. Uh, we also see cards like Overtex Coatless turning off spells and traps, or Superconductor, Ultimate Conductor Tyranno uh, being able to flip all opponents' monsters face down. Right. So she she has ways of interacting. Yes, certainly. Both of these players only played in uh, one event, different events. Um, Mart uh, Estenita here played at the European Championships in Utrecht, which gained her a 57% win ratio. She went 4-3. Okay. Um, and then Marcus Schmidt, he played during uh, the second YCS Prague of 2017 <laughs> and ended on a 60% win ratio. Okay. It was 6-4. So okay. it's very fair to assume that this is, at least it seems like this is the, the highest accomplishment in, in a little while for these two guys. Yeah. Um, well, of course, we must remember that across only one event, Someone can have a bad day. Yeah. They may, of yeah, course, absolutely. be very strong players that just didn't happen to have everything line up for them on yeah. that tournament. It's only natural that you say that because we looked at your win ratio, Thomas. 
<laughs> and there was this one <laughs> event that made all the difference in that win ratio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, yeah, there was um, passing all of this tournament data. There's every now and again there's some errors in it, and we have, what actually happened was we only managed to get halfway through the tournaments when we checked uh, tournament when we checked Tom's win ratio. No, is it because he's playing so much? Or it was just we we, we we only had half of his tournaments, and it was we just happened to have five of the bad tournaments. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So, uh, my my true win ratio we we saw later was a little healthier than uh -huh, the one that you saw uh -huh. initially. Yeah. Uh, right. But yeah, it certainly didn't look good. So I the stats were stacked against you. Yes, yeah. in this case. <laughs> but we we have more data now. All right. Uh, so now we're going to see, as we're saying, Trishula and Enter Blathnir, or potentially uh, True King of All Calamities, coming into play here. And uh, it's important to note that Marcus has nothing to stop anything here. Um, he needs to just watch and hope that Estanita isn't going to go too crazy. He does have a Torrential Tribute, Swap Frog, Solemn Judgment, Ronin Totem, and Paleozoic Dynamiscus. But one of these cards, the Torrential, has just been picked from his hand. <laughs> He's now uh, having to read the true king of all calamities. Uh, calamities sorry. Uh, lots of text, but that's the standard for half of these Exceed monsters. You can detach one Exceed material from this card once per turn. Declare one attribute. All phase of monsters on the field become that attribute. Also, all monsters in your opponent's possession with that attribute cannot activate the effects or attack. So, really good way of stopping your opponent from doing anything, like you pointed out earlier, Thomas. And uh, monsters that true Drake or true king monsters in your hand would destroy their effects can be chosen, chosen from your opponent's field. I don't think that's going to be at play here. Uh, not on this turn. So the True King's destruction to summon will only happen on Estanita's turn. Mm -hmm. But she is playing those cards, so it could be used in subsequent turns. Right. True King of All Calamities is really strong. Uh, so Marcus just drew for his turn, and he it looked for a second like he was signaling with his hand, signaling with his hand that he, it's Estanita's turn again. I cannot imagine no. that to be the case. Um, a lot of trap cards. To yeah, set. exactly. He wants to set something here, and now he does. He has the Solemn Judgment in his hand that we've seen paying, playing a critical role in uh, previous games. I we think it was in the round oh, four feature match, something like that. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, it stopped. like a, It was like a plus five evenly matched. Yeah. And it was the last card that um, the UK player drew. I don't remember yeah. the name, but it, I know he was from the UK. Okay, so uh, Marcus setting something up here with three face down trap cards. It, it was Carmelo Boutiglieri. Oh, was it Carmelo? I take everything back I said. He's obviously not from the UK. That's a German name as they come. Yeah. So uh, Estanita here picking up a Ghost Ogre for her turn. Uh, she'll be able to swing and connect through here for just over 4,000 damage. No, instead opts only to leave the True King in attack position. Playing around Mirror Forces. Interesting. We haven't seen anybody play around that card. And we don't actually see any Mirror Force cards in the Paleozoic deck, but just fear of their existence is enough to affect how players will go up against that matchup. So I'm not 100% sure what's face down for Marcus. It's definitely not the cards that you see on the screen right now. Uh, I think it's a uh, yes, Dynamiscus. Paleozoic Dynamiscus, a Torrential Tribute, and a Solemn Judgment. I think the Tribute got picked. Okay. So I think the Tribute is no longer like a relevant card, basically. Well, we certainly know that there was a, a Solemn Judgment that does remain yeah. face down. Yeah, it's the Judgment, the Miscus. We're, go we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And one other set. It was the uh, Dimensional Barrier? I did, believe. did he draw into one? I mean, I if, if he did, then yes. I yes. think he saw one copy of Dimensional Barrier. Oh, okay. It seems like we now got the correct cards. I think. Did he have a second torrential, maybe? Is that. Possibly, I think that may be what he drew for his turn. I mean, turn. He's, he's playing all three. Yeah, I think he uh, drew another torrential tribute for his turn. All right, so, so now we're up to date again, guys. A swap, frog in, f swap frog in hand for Marcus. And his field at the at the moment is the Solemn and the Torrential Tribute. Two Swap Frogs in hand now. This opens the floodgates for Toads and Mr. Boys to start hitting the board here. Huh? 
Estanita choosing not to use her ghost ogre in hand to destroy this swap frog. She doesn't know, of course, that there is another swap frog in hand, but I think if she'd uh, used the ghost ogre there, she would have been able to prevent uh, Totally Awesome from hitting the board this yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Marcus wouldn't have been able to get those two monsters onto the field, which is the, the key number to get the Totally Awesome. <laughs> Gonna get a quicker to run and toad and attack him first. Yeah, that, that feels like a bit of an oversight here. Not only would it prevent the toad, but it would have also left uh, Marcus in a position possibly unable to attack over the Oviraptor. What's the defense on Soul Eating Oviraptor? It'll now be in the graveyard. Yeah, just bringing it up for you guys. 500 only, so. That's still enough to wall off a Ronin Toden. <laughs> wall off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a relative term. Mm -hmm. The wall doesn't have to be that high. Yeah, that's a very, that's a, it's a fence. Yeah. Fence. It's it's fencing off that. <laughs> Just a curb, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so what could be the l uh, what's going through your head? Why wouldn't you? Oh, uh, the ghost ogre just disappeared. She dropped it now. The ghost ogre was used on the effect of uh, totally awesome to summon from the deck. It will force the activation of Toad, enabling Estenita to, to make her plays in this turn. Uh, she might have decided that it's too important for the soul linking Overaptor to resolve and that she needs to get Toad off the board before summoning it. Hmm. She doesn't know, of course, that there is a solemn judgment waiting, so if Marcus is afraid of this Overraptor, it the summon won't even go through. If he's very afraid of it. I mean, mm. it's 4,000 life points we're talking about. Big investment. On the other hand, a small pi price to pay if that means you win the game. Yeah. If the Overraptor summon isn't negated, it would enable access to one of the baby dinosaurs mm -hmm. to then pop with the diagram. Yeah, and yeah. obviously the correct read from Marcus. So he goes with that big investment, 4,000. But suddenly, there's nothing stopping him from, like, maybe even wrapping things up. A bit too early to tell. But he can go crazy here. Yeah, pit, Certainly, pit. without Master Rule 4, he would absolutely have enough damage to kill this turn. The limitation of summoning from the extra deck may slow him down a little bit, but we'll definitely see a development into another totally awesome and... Even if it's not lethal damage this turn, there's no way that Estenita is likely to be getting back into this game. Right. Yep. Paleys are not known for their massive pushing power, yeah. but certainly they can put enough control on the board. They're, to they're also not known for forgiving your opponent no. to, to give them an, an opening like this one. Yeah, exactly. Marcus, unwilling to commit any cards to a Mistar Boy, just wanting to make the absolute minimum push possible each turn, conserving water monsters in hand, and holding things very tight. Uh, does he play one or two <laughs> Mistar Boys in his extra deck? He does, he does play two copies. And now, if he was able to summon two copies of Mistar Boy and one Totally Awesome, I believe that's 8,000 damage immediately. But perhaps he didn't have quite enough resources to get there. Sorry, I was just I wasn't chuckling at you, Tom, I was chuckling at totally awesome picture. <laughs> <laughs> I actually learned a little bit more about totally awesome and about what what it what it actually is. What it represents? Yeah, what it represents. It represents hope. Hope that, for frog players. Well, yeah, that as well. It's a it's a, a mochi treat that you you have in a particular um festival in Japan. I, c I can't remember. Oh, right. So there's a full st background story. Yeah, yeah, full background story. Okay. Of, of like particular, mo it's like a particular mochi okay, treat. Give us some eat. more information. I want to, I want to hear that totally awesome fan fiction. Yeah, I need to, <laughs> I need to look it up. My <laughs> Japanese teacher was telling me about it. Once there was a toad alive. Then he met his soulmate. And they decided to juggle oranges on top of them. Or maybe they that's an apple. I think no, that's an apple. No, they're not orange. They're not either of those things. It's a sp specific fruit that they they have. It's not a tangerine either. <laughs> so, uh, the, the tech team is chiming in. They are like, "Yeah, well, I'm fascinated by this. Keep, keep talking." The, the frog and his soulmate must be uh, terrified of this matchup with uh, soul-eating over raptors running around all over. Right. The place. <laughs> so. At the moment, Estanita is, is a bit put into that, not exactly in the driver's seat. She's, she's more like taking the back seat here. No not way. much she can do. 
Um, she does have a kaiju in hand, but... Uh, she shouldn't be living to see her next turn at this point. Yeah. The, the game should have ended last turn, and it will definitely be over this turn. Yeah, it's a, it's a New Year's it's a New Year's celebration. Uh, it's called mochisuki, uh, and yeah, people make mochi and eat mochi with toads. No, no, it's nothing to do with toads. Oh, it's got nothing to do with toads. It's now, about now I'm disappointed. Estanita sees the writing on the wall here. Perhaps not the clinical finish it could have been, but it it gets the chop it. done. Let's just say Marcus got the chop done. He's leading 1-0 after 15 minutes in that round 10. So now it's going to be side decking time, and uh, both of these guys have a bit more choice when it comes to side decking options. Um, we see a little bit of disruption or destruction in Estanita side deck with Raigeki. There is disruption as well with Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries, evenly matched. Cosmic Cyclone, she's got one ABC Dragon Buster. Uh, that's, that's for, for the, the Ghost, Ghost Reaper. Reapers, yep. But she hasn't chosen to also side deck totally awesome. Paleozoic, seen as a, an underdog, a bit of a rogue strategy for this event, wasn't warranted that she wanted to side deck it, but she may now be regretting that because yeah. a Ghost Reaper on the Totally Awesome puts the, the Paleozoic frog deck in a position where their biggest and best engine is no longer doing anything. Instead, we're likely to see Evenly Matched coming in, mm -hmm. uh, a second copy of Dogaran, the Mad Flame Kaiju, being able to take out those toads, and Cosmic Cyclones <coughs> also being able to remove by banishing the Paleozoic traps can get them out of the game before they start being recycled from the graveyard. Right. We haven't really... I mean, her, her deck started strong, but then no follow-up. And uh, as, so, as soon as it comes to a war of attrition where, where both players are like, trying to find more resources as the game progresses. Yeah. That usually favors Paleozoic. Yeah, I think that was something that we actually saw um, in previous formats with Paleozoic, that they they just ground you to having no resources yeah. left. And they then just hang, keep hanging in there. You, sometimes you're like, okay, yeah. I got this finally, and then there's another trap coming back from the yeah. from the graveyard. Yeah, oh, but this was before Master Rule 4, and you know they would suddenly just Opa being a totally awesome, you know, a bunch of things that would just be able to attack and do a lot of damage. This Paleozoic deck doesn't feel quite like the same grinder strategy that we've seen in the past. So there's no card of demise mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. refill that hand if all of the traps get exhausted. Instead, we see Gamaciels to deal with monster threats and the uh, continuous trap cards, anti-spell fragrance and rivalry of warlords. It looks like it's more trying to set up and a floodgate wall strategy rather than just using one-for-one one traps and having more cards than the opponent. It's interesting, yeah. It's a, it's a different approach to what those decks used to do when Vanessa's Emptiness was legal. We just assembled <laughs> a field and then backed it up with Vanessa's Emptiness and that, was, that yeah. was pretty much it. And maybe eight years earlier, same with Royal Oppression. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So one very popular card. Royal Oppression. <laughs> On the oh, I wonder why. <laughs> Ten years ago with Imperial Order. No, wait, we have that now. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. do have that again. It's not quite the same, though, because you don't get to have... The, 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 the errata actually made a real big difference to it. Real big difference. Yeah, we almost saw one game being decided by the, the cost for the, the uh, payment that yeah. you have to do now. In the finals of the, the European Championships this, this year, he, uh, Marcello Barberi had that exact issue. He put it out, or he could have been the top four, but yeah, he put, put out Imperial Order to stop a very key play by his opponent and then ended up paying all the way down to 300, 300 life points. Yeah, something like that. And then, yeah, he, he, then he, won. he was destroyed. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, and then he came back anyway. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit anticlimactic because he, he ended up winning, but yes, uh, it, it was very close. It was, a, yeah, it was phenomenal. Lots play. and lots <laughs> of trap cards from Marcus Schmidt here with uh, Olenoides. Solemn Judgment, Torrential Tribute, Canadia, and a fifth card that also happens to be a trap, I think. <coughs> but we're almost certainly going to be seeing Estanita playing first again. So she's got the same Foolish Burial Monster Reborn terraforming as we saw in game one, but this time she's drawn the Soul Eating Over Raptor, so she won't need to activate two spells just to get it onto the field. The, the fifth card in hand for Marcus is Dimensional Barrier. Yeah. So he's got... Yeah, I mean, once he's got a foot in this game, he can he can make sure he, he stays where he's at. He's, he can really disrupt Estanita's place, but 
she's going to go first. And I think we're going to see a pretty good opening, just like in the first turn, or first game. And we may see uh, one or more of those pieces in Marcus's hand no longer there when it gets around to his turn. <laughs> yeah, so don't hold your breath if you're a fan of the Paleozoic frogs. They're just going to have their soul eaten now. I think we'll see a baby Cerasaurus coming out here with mm -hmm. Dragonic Diagram previously being added to hand. Very similar to start to the previous game. Yeah, and there's also the Monster Reborn to follow it up. But this time the Monster Reborn won't be needed for getting the plays started. So it may be more impactful coming down later in the turn right. when it can bring back something much more powerful. Yeah, I love cards like that in, in combo decks where they, they are so powerful at starting the combo but can also extend a combo. Yeah. We, we saw the same in, in Zodiac with uh, Shuffle Reborn was sometimes really impactful in both of those ways. It's just great when you have cards that do more things in more <laughs> situations. <laughs> yeah. Shuffle Reborn, of course, also having another effect in the graveyard. Yeah. People would put back their tankies if they're on a very small hand, just trying to dig for a new Zodiac monster to continue the game. Yeah, it was it was really great usage of Shuffle Reborn. So here we see the the combo. Baby Cerasaurus. Baby Cerasaurus, yeah. It's pretty good. Looks like Giant Rex being put to the top there. <laughs> Miscellaneousaurus obviously already being in hand at this point, usually a key search target, but now limited and only one being able to use per turn anyway. Estanita just taking a moment to think about positioning, it seems here. Be worried in her position with Kiwi watching over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the Damocles sword. On top of you. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, uh, do you think we're going to see the Agni Mazud? Yes. Here it comes. And a third baby Cerasaurus effect in this first turn. Wow. Back when cards didn't say hard ones per turn. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything more ideal than this opening for a Mestanita? Well, we still have to see what she'll end her board on here. I mean, uh, could. But it does look like she's going for a similar play with Trishula into a rank 9 mm. if she's choosing to summon Jurak Eolo. I mean, she could also have an Imperial Order in hand and then a Hand Trap on top of one of these other things. That would have been even better, wouldn't it? That would be a straight 10. <coughs> but still, we got this Monster Reborn that could extend the play even further. Yep. Uh, Imperial Order and Hand Trap might make her feel safe, but we can see a hand of five traps on the other side of the board. Imperial Order, not going to do a great deal. And yeah. the hand traps, mostly just there to stop spells and monsters. I was I was speaking in a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> like, not, not looking at this particular match. But yeah. What, what does she want to pick here? Which card? Well, probably not the Canadia. Solemn Judgment would have been good, right? Uh, Solemn Judgment would have been nice. I think either the Solemn Judgment or possibly the Torrential Tribute. Mm. Uh, Big impact cards. Having the ability to clear out a resolved board is absolutely critical for uh, Marcus here. We'll see another card being taken out by the uh, Phantom Fortress. And there there's the judgment. judgment. And that makes all the difference. I mean, now she knows the one judgment that can be played is gun. Uh, there is no, no more, uh, almost no more big interruptions coming from Marcus. He does play one warning as well, but there's a bit of a difference there. Yeah. And then the Foolish Burial to send the Overtex Coatless. In the previous game, we saw it having to be used to find the Soul Eating Overaptor. Here, it's going to just build that board even stronger. Yeah. Coatless it will search for the Double Evolution Pill, Double Evolution Pill, quite likely to summon a second copy of the Coatless here to give negation for spells and traps. It looks like Estanita has this game pretty much locked down I on turn I one. I also think that you can tell that she's, she's moving faster. She's yeah. moving a bit faster. She seems to have gotten a bit more confident just with that Solemn Judgment pick. And uh, now there is no more doubt for her. She's like, yes, I am on track. I'm going to tie these games. And the uh, Giant Rex being banished for the cost of the uh, double evolution pill there. It'll return to the field. <laughs> cost in inverted commas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a donation. Yeah. That you can uh, use for taxes and claim, <laughs> claim them back, Ooh. basically. Just takes half a turn. It's much, much faster than German bureaucracy. I remember with Gen X Undying, the cost being sending <laughs> a water monster <laughs> oh to yeah. the graveyard. Yeah, that was a terrible price to pay. So 
we see Ultimate Conductor being chosen over the Overtex Coatless there. W what's the logic there? Uh, Ultimate <laughs> Conductor is able to <laughs> flip face down any frogs that get played, but it'll have no effect on any Paleozoics that hit the board, all, of course, being unaffected by monsters. Yeah, again, though, I think, um, as Ollie was saying about thinking about it in a vacuum, Estenita was really getting ripped apart by a totally awesome last time. So maybe, you know, she's thinking, I need to prevent what happened last game. Yeah. It's also really hard to adapt so much during these, these mm -hmm. matches. Yeah. Especially if a deck is as flexible as Paleozoic can be. But I think it's it's a matter of if she gets like one more good hit or something, if she if she assembles something, Marcus is just gonna draw and say, Okay, I'm gonna call this a day. Mm. There there is that chance. He just has to stay focused, go through that entire combo and end up on a very high note. Sounds easier. Now we just see uh, Petty Tyrannodon uh, was summoned by the Miscellaneousaurus and then destroyed in the end phase by that lingering effect, bringing out Doggerand to the field. Mm. There's a lot of attack points there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to mess with those dinosaurs. They might be extinct, but not today. This is like taking a live virtual reality museum tour. Yeah, and Estelita is like the tour guide. She, she's, she's like, look at this thing. It has a lot of teeth. And all all of this tour is based on the uh, the Phantom Fortress. <laughs> yeah, right. That's scary, right? Usually you have aircraft carriers that are sending out little aircrafts. They're dropping dinosaurs. They're dropping dinosaurs. <laughs> it's raining dinosaurs. Yeah. That's Some somebody help me. That's terrifying. Yeah, you need an umbrella for that. Yeah. <laughs> that would be. A Pretty big umbrella. <laughs> it would be, yeah. Uh, think more nuclear bunker. <laughs> 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 All right, come on. Also, you oh. oh, oh, what's happening? Hold. Hold, hold. I might be having something. What could he be having here? Uh, we see there was a... Yeah, spawn Paleo card. Olenoides, yep. a mm -hmm. Torrential Tribute, and one other set card coming down here. That's beautiful that uh, Estenita decided to change her mind as what she wanted to play. <laughs> That's completely valid if your opponent stops you and yep. says, oh, no, no, we're back, we're back, we're back, uh, we're back there. I want to play something. Yeah, that's extra information, so... Dimensional barrier, oh, yeah. cooling Xyz monsters here to prevent that central card from being banished. Yep. So that reveals that that central card must be fairly important. But even if the dimensional barrier... There's a lot of dinos with a lot of teeth. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It it's all comes down for me whether Estenita chooses to continue summoning cards. Right, here. right. So there's a torrential tribute on the other side of the field. It's We're back to the Sarayuya problem. Just because you can does not mean that you should. Yeah. There's enough damage on the field right now. But again, Estenita was scared of Mirror Force in the first game. She, she might have been. Let's. Uh, there might be other yeah, reasons, okay, yeah. but true, yeah. true, true, true. It looked like she yes, was playing yeah. around that card. Yeah, you're right. It's heavily implied by her <laughs> by her switch to defense. Oof. But you are right. It could be could have been something else. This is gonna be really a nail biter if you're a fan of either the dinosaur deck or the girl in the feature match table. Um, you're not gonna hope for her to summon another monster. Yeah, it's all about torrential tribute. Well, point. at this point, she's used the effect of her diagram to destroy Baby Cerasaurus. It seems unlikely that she wouldn't then be summoning a monster with that effect. Yeah, we're gonna see. Uh, let's let's watch Marcus's face. He's gonna. Over Raptor will be summoned. She'll activate the effect to search or to send a dinosaur, and then as Chainlink too, we're gonna see Is he everything. Gonna get greedy? Go wrong. I feel like he's getting greedy. Okay, I didn't get greedy. No, uh, no need. Estenita is displeased. Yeah. That's rough. Oof. Yeah, after that solemn judgment was gone, maybe a bit too overconfident. I don't know exactly what what happened there. I mean, you can also do these things in ma main phase two. Yeah. I mean, it might not be ideal, but in this situation, yeah, absolutely. there was an argument to be to be had. Yeah. Oof, this is this is talk about two steps forward, four steps back. This is not making progress. No, that's that's rough. Yeah, like, Tom, can you understand here why why an attack wasn't just the first the first option? Uh, my only thought is trying to develop a board 
with Overtex Coatless already on the field before going to the battle phase yeah. uh, to have the ability to negate a spell or trap. Yeah, agreed. In hindsight, do you think that the the Ultimate Conductor Toronto should have been an Overtex Coatless in the first place? Even before the uh, Ultimate Conductor was summoned, I was in a position where I think that uh, Overtex would have been the stronger choice. Um, but possibly mm. more fear for the frog engine than for the spells and traps. Mm. All right. <coughs> now that once the reborn is going to prove that it's a good card. <laughs> yeah. This is this is the first time it's proving it to be a good card to you. Yep. Yeah, that yeah. is that is the that is going to be the moment where I'm like, oh, this card is actually useful. I didn't think that. <laughs> Estenita still favoring the uh, ultimate conductor over the choice of something like a level <coughs> four dinosaur just to have access to uh, evolves our Lagia. Oh no, instead we see baby Cerasaurus coming out for the effect of Oviraptor. So Is she just going to assemble another big field? Uh, it will depend on what she has in deck to summon with this baby Cerasaurus. So she'll get back a monster from Grave with the effect of the Oviraptor. And then if there's anything left, one from deck with the baby Cerasaurus. Hmm. Get the giant Rex. I think there was one or two left. Giant Rex being put into defense position, I assume by the effect of Oviraptor. Not that it matters a great deal here as it's not able to attack directly anyway. I talk about a bad beat, like that Torrential Tribute. Yeah. <laughs> Don't think we're going to see another one with that much impact this weekend. Yep. Yeah, particularly for a deck like Dinosaurs. Uh, we often see Torrential Tribute being used to great effect against Pendulum, but if they can establish another Link monster, uh, another copy of Electromite, they can just Pendulum Summon everything back out from the oh, extra deck. Marcus yep. gets to see the, the entirety of Estenita's deck now yeah. because she doesn't no have target. another target. That's rough. So, yeah, n none of this is going according to plan right now. No. That Torrential was colossal. I was, I thought you were going to say, devastating. Ah, I was trying to avoid the devastating. Right, so she's rebuilding with Tornado Dragon. Uh, uh, the Paleozoic Olenoidas here will take out the Dragonic Diagram, but Tornado Dragon will discourage any back row from being set this next turn. Yeah, but Marcus has a Swap Frog, which is going to be able to get him rolling on the Frog Train. Swap Frog, not enough by itself. Uh, he would need to find another water monster to yep. be able to actually get to Toad. Yeah, absolutely. But at least get him, at least get him going. Um, okay. The turn being rewound here. Not entirely sure why. Are there any limits on what can be summoned after using any of the effects that were uh, played possi in that Possibly. Turn? I think, yeah, maybe Oviraptor, you can only summon dinosaurs afterwards. Oh, right. That sounds like the kind of thing that would be a restriction. Nope. No, no idea. <laughs> no. And wow, we see <laughs> Talk the about Swap Frog top Water deck. Monster. <laughs> oh my. Oof. This match has been flipped on its head and I'm not entirely mm. sure what has caused that. With one top deck. Ah, Dimensional Barrier. Earlier on ah, in the day. Uh, yes. right, yes. That was so early, like that was yeah. 10 minutes ago. I'm not even kidding. That was 10 minutes ago in that turn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, good point. Good catch by our judges. Yeah, that was that was phenomenal. I would have, uh, you could have like seen that dimensional barrier, gone to the judge area, made yourself a sandwich, came back, and then you were just just right in time to say, nope, that's not possible. There was a dimensional barrier yeah. activated earlier before I got my sandwich. But now it looks to be all locked <laughs> up for the uh, Paleozoic deck here. Yeah, yeah. It's talking about a game that was flipped on its head. You're right. Um, this torrential tribute. I mean, just look at the graveyard uh, of Marcus. He's like four cards deep in his deck or five cards, something like that. And just that one card made all the difference. Yeah. Estanita, on her last turn, just needing to go to her battle phase and attack the game, but instead ending up in a position where it looks like she's out of this match. I would be surprised if she can support a comeback here. 
yeah, it's not looking great. Professor Frog coming to defend the rights of the Totally Awesome. I feel like the first Totally Awesome hitting the board for the Paleozoic player must represent at least a 30 or 40% swing in the probability of them winning this mm. game. Yeah. I mean, on the bright side, this match is extremely educational. Like, if, if you're not sure how to play and what to do at a larger event, this is, is a really good showcase yeah. of, of things to do and, unfortunately, also some things not to do. Yeah, if there's... If in, if in game one I'd have seen the Mirror Force, then... Yeah. Definitely the right play to, to try and play around it. But what's likely? Um, what's more likely? <laughs> well, in fact, it is Mirror Force. Hmm. Do yeah. we see the Mirror Force cards being played much? We saw Paleozoics on in round one with yeah, Eugen Height playing them. I yeah, if we're talking about sheer numbers, then they're more likely to have Mirror Forces. But yeah, no, true. Uh, no, my my point being, are the Mirror Forces actually being played at the moment? I'm not yes. convinced that they necessarily I are. No, no, no. I haven't seen a single one yes, this weekend. Yes, absolutely. I'm just thinking sheer number wise. Okay. But but yes, as far as what is being played, I mean, if let's let's just agree, if you have eight thousand attack on the field, then yeah, saying battle phase is usually a pretty good idea. Yeah, well, either either way, um, if she'd have just attacked and had a board wiped, it was the same result as playing into torrential. Yeah. But instead, she had the if if she plays Increased into torrential, risk. Well, t if she, att she attacks and there is no mirror force, then absolutely win. Yeah. Whereas if she summoned more monsters into torrential if there was no torrential there was still there's a result no still immediate the victory yeah. there's no immediate victory i mean may maybe she thought there might have been like one paleozoic uh, the book paleozoic that can yeah, flip one be. face down something like that the obvious line that i can see for her is that she was trying to summon an overtex coatless to her side of the field yeah, to, to offer sure. protection before she goes to the battle mm. phase uh i stand by thinking that that should have been the, the monster summoned with the double evolution right, right. pill you in the that, first yeah. turn. Uh, and in that position, she then could have definitely gone straight to the battle phase. But we saw yeah. another line being taken and no safety net for any spell or trap activations. Yeah, it of course, it's, it's easy for us to say as we're seeing the perfect information. But, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's certainly, certainly something to think about. <laughs> Missed our boy with his top hat and monocle. And just one totally awesome here will be enough damage for an exact lethal? No, 1,000 short. And in fact, perfect timing is the Mako theme on, uh, on the live stream right now. Well, ah, there's a Raigeki there as well. There comes the Raigeki. Right. Ah, That's 8,000 damage <coughs> with those three monsters alone. And Estanita is also on 6-6 six, six anyway. So, oof, that was one dream getting crushed right there. Unfortunately for Estanita Martina, the the hope of uh, entering into the top 32 is open, but Markus Schmidt with his Paleozoic deck is still well on track. Let's talk about that and more in our post-match analysis. You've just seen a, a very interesting feature match that was actually going back and forth. Uh, both games, Estanita Martina was allowed to go first, assembled a really big field, and, and it, both times Paleozoic found an answer to just like find basically the way out of that labyrinth that they were put in. Yeah. So um, the second game is a bit easier to, to talk about because there, Estanita had everything uh, just overextended. This was basically like the definition of an overextension, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. And uh, plays into a torrential tribute with no backup plan. Yeah. Uh, very, very little in terms of backup plan. Yeah, it, it really just went downhill for her. And following on from that torrential tribute, there were some questionable plays with searching was for the effect of the Oviraptor mm. that she summoned uh, with the baby Cerasaurus. I suspect at that point she'll be completely flustered yeah. and not quite playing at her best. Yeah. We, we did see that in the first game that there was an, an option to drop a, a hand trap. I think it was when she could have dropped an Ash Blossom um, to Ghost prevent... Ghost uh, Ogre on Swap Frog. Oh, Ghost Ogre on Swap Frog to, to prevent a totally awesome... Uh, hitting play basically yeah. didn't go for that so so maybe it was the the bright lights in the feature match area yeah. sitting in the spotlight for the f very first time we, we have a lot of players that say that the first time it's really really hard yeah and as we could see from the 
their win rates in their tournament history that we that we have. There was only like two tournaments, so yeah, even so even just the tournament setting is sometimes quite intimidating. So yeah, just just being at a at a large yeah. tournament for the first time ever, and today still 444 players yeah, sleeping up early players. in the morning. So that's that's larger than some some other tournaments. Not yeah. a YCS, they tend to be a little bit bigger. Yeah, the entire the entirety of the hall is also completely filled with people playing public yeah. events. With, yeah, you know, so giant it's giant cards and it's scary in that regard. Events, so. And of course, um, yeah. the feature match area is now open, so players can actually like stand there and and look and yeah. uh, intimidate you. With, yeah, yeah. you with don't just have the people on stream watching, but you have people physically just stood there. Yeah, in the just venue. meters away. It's uh, it's more scary than um, knowing that some other people are gonna yeah. watch it later on, uh, unless you made a mistake. Because then most of the time you're just like, oh, all my friends it's are immortalized. Yeah, <laughs> when we learned yesterday that's uh, the Kanosa Gang. Um, that was that was our educational program yesterday. Okay, so what do we make of uh, pure dinosaurs after this? Um, it does seem like it is packing a punch. Maybe yeah. maybe more so than any other deck, to be honest, in terms of just raw attack power i i think that the deck possibly if it had been played out a little bit differently could could have won that match and possibly should have won that match mm -hmm. with those starts um a few mistakes it's only natural at this point in an event people are tired we finished very late last night but i don't think there's any issues with the dinosaur deck that could have that could have gone very very differently right and uh paleozoic frog it's the second time we've had it on the feature match this weekend we had it in Round number one, Eugen Hyde versus um, Jörg Müller. Um, it won there. It won again now. So they, we also looked at the, we did look at the metagame breakdown. Didn't even show up in the top seven decks. Uh, so it was a part of that other category. And then now in round 10, maybe we can bring that up for you guys. I can't make any promises. Uh, maybe we can bring that up. Um, yeah. In round 10, it's suddenly in seventh place with 11 players still playing that deck out of 444. So very low number, but it seems like a very good conversion rate for that yeah. particular deck. Paleozoic again here, just showing how it's able to stay in games when it looks like the opponent has amassed an insurmountable field. The, the dinosaur board there was huge, but even with very few cards, a powerful trap flipped at the right moment can take down anything. Yeah. All right. So... That's it for this match. We're going to try and bring in the winner, Marcus Schmidt, for a quick post-match interview, guys. Uh, we have been a little bit behind the main event also because of that technical mix-up at the start of the match. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back with our winner interview for round 10. <laughs> 